back to Eggs the Podcast, featuring the best and brightest minds in business leadership, entrepreneurship, and technology. Today, we're excited to have Robert Patton on the show. Robert is the founder of Creative Agency Success, a consulting firm dedicated to helping creative agencies scale. Robert is known for being a deeply inquisitive and analytical leader with a distinct ability to devise solutions to elevate companies and lifestyles. He's a two-time international best-selling author and is passionate about sharing his next-level strategies so that creative agency leaders will find fulfillment and growth. Join us as we dive into his insights and expertise on scaling creative agencies and so much more. Welcome to the show, Robert Patton. Hey, Robert. How are you, man? I'm doing very well. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for making the time. Yeah. Uh, why don't you give us a brief, brief history of who you are, uh, your work background, and how you got to where you're at today? Yeah. Uh, well, I'm going to kind of dig a, quite a bit far back um, to start off. It'll make sense, I, I guess, as the things progress in my story. Um, I would say that my career kind of started when I was 12 years old. Um, my my dad owned uh, an accounting firm, a CPA firm, and um, I would do bookkeeping and tax prep back when I was 12 years old, helping him being able to get things sort of moving and um, during the really busy times. And so I spent a lot of my formative years in accounting and financial analysis and and, and deep sort of consulting um, guided information for, for both my dad's firm and then later on in public accounting by the... Uh, the time it, when you're in your like late teens, right, you're supposed to figure out what you want to do with your life. And I had uh, not um, really figured out the like creative end of my brain, right? Like I was a massive analytical person and I decided to go in the very opposite direction of what I had uh, considered previously of what I would want to do and what was like my natural born instinct and ended up going to school for photography. Um, after finishing up school, I had a commercial photography business. And I actually learned in time that I absolutely was not meant to do it. I did not enjoy <laughs> it. I absolutely hated it. And so I shut that business down and uh, traveled for a bit and um, ended up just falling in my lap, found an agency. And it was like this perfect combination for me of the creative side that I had been looking to foster, the analytical side of what I had grown up with and had was just naturally born with and really enjoying um, the numbers component of everything. So it was like this great co crossover and helped that agency scale quite significantly, um, left that agency, did it again, and then kind of landed where I am now, right? It was, a, I ultimately just fell in love with the psychology of it, the creativeness of it, the data piece of it, and really just found where I was meant to be. Yeah, no, I think that's amazing. And especially, you know, it, it, I'm listening to your story and I used to share an office with a guy that was kind of like this. He's a photographer, uh, we each ran our own little freelance business, but we were, you know, sharing a space and he, he was a photographer, but he was hyper analytical, kind of like what you're describing. And I always joked that, you know, I mean, he was like the kind of guy that if you ask how to take a picture, he'll give you the explanation of how to build a camera. Right. So he would give you sort of the, the technical everything. And then he was probably like an artist second in his case, you know, like he wasn't like me who is a creative person, designer, and horrible at all the analytics stuff, you know, like I'm busy just being creative and aloof and, and all that stuff, but I'm not thinking at all about the serious matters at hand, which has actually been a real you know problem for me in growing my business over the years. And so, uh, so I wonder if you talk about just sort of finding that perfect fit and how you find a, you know, the companies that work for you, because it seems to me that you've got a nice hybrid of both creativity and also analytics. And I don't know if that's the case when you run into a lot of agency owners. I mean, largely, yes, right, which is ultimately creates a lot of meaning for me, right? A lot of creatives are exactly that. They're not very number oriented. They're not looking at the data points. There's very kind of an emotional feeling to the way that they manage their business, which leaves them in a place of essentially being really unsure about what what should be the next step. Are they headed in the right direction, which is where I'm able to provide a lot of support. Um, interestingly, in the story you mentioned about that photographer, when I was studying photography which was quite quite funny i think is that i i spent loads of time in like the mathematical equations of like how far should the camera be away from the subject <laughs> and exactly how far the light should be exactly to the right degree and so i absolutely applied that very analytical mindset to even the creative output of what i was working on um and and largely you need both pieces right i absolutely ap apply the creative problem solving which is how i approach every single client's 
challenge that they're currently faced with is there's the programmatic way of what a lot of people will say you should do, right? And I do not believe in a one size fits all. I do not believe in silver bullets. They they do not exist. I have yet to find one. If anyone listening today has one, any of them, please shoot me an email with that silver bullet. Um, but uh, creatively solving problems and looking at how can I solve this particular issue and what I would say is kind of my zone of genius is like looking through the hundreds of agencies that I've I've worked with over the years. I pick and choose like the different pieces of their models, backing it up with the data point that allows for us to know, hey, this is the direction ultimately we should go and creating that equation that is meant for that agency owner, right? Who they are as a person, the client profile of who they're working with, the service profile of what, what they're ultimately doing so that it's an equation that's really truly be- meant for them and taking best practice into account. Yeah, I think that's okay. right because I mean, it's just, you know, it's, especially for, I mean, and again, I'm speaking a little bit from my own experience, but like I was an art guy first and basically as an extension of my freelance business, we ended up starting an agency. Just, I got too busy on my own. And so we added teammates and boom, there you go. You have an agency. So, but for people like mm-hmm. me who are sort of a tactician, you know, like we have a skill set, and that, that got us to the dance. Right. But then the rest of that stuff that we have to fill in the, the analytics, the trying to run the business has certainly been a weak spot for me. And so in trying to find partners to work with or people who can elevate our business, you know, it's always been a real challenge because not only do I not know what I need, I need somebody who can, you know, I guess, walk me through what, you know, help me understand uh, what it is that I don't know, because, uh, you know, and and for me, that's proven to be almost impossible. <laughs> and so I haven't found anybody yet. And so, um, so I wonder, you know, when you're talking to these, these business owners, I mean, how can you help them, I guess, even really understand their problem? And I guess I'm having a hard time articulating this, but the idea is that, you know, for a tactician or somebody like, you know, like myself, I will slog for hours. I will lose track of time. I will not record time. I will not do, you know, any of the things, um, you know, almost as a labor of love. And then I'll be bummed later when I look at the check and I go, you know, this isn't enough money for what I was trying to do. So like, how do you help somebody, you know, either like me or maybe somebody who's matured beyond that, that has gotten to the point where, you know, they, they feel like they have systems, but they're not making enough money. Like, I mean, how do you tell, like, help them identify what's wrong, I guess? Well, there's, uh, you, you asked a very broad <laughs> yeah, question. Sorry, I, I know there's to... like about 150 things <laughs> in there. Sorry. This is coming from a real personal place. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. Um. Well, here's the first piece, right? Ultimately. And as you mentioned, which is ultimately a big sort of issue is that that time tracking component of it. But the, the first piece that I would say is starting to actually segment the different roles that ultimately you're playing as a business owner. Like, am I wearing the CEO hat? Am I wearing the technician hat? Am I wearing the creative hat? And like, what am I doing in that particular moment and understanding what percentage of your time should you be spending in each one of these different areas and making sure that you're investing back into the business? The creative mind and married to a creative and I, I find the creative mind absolutely fascinating. And the fact that you can spend so many hours just driving into one particular concept, looking at loads of different pieces of it and spend an incredible amount of like patience that I absolutely do not have myself. And I find it phenomenal, but it also does create the problem that you were just describing. And the fact that you will be working on a specific project and you will lose all track of time. You will have no idea how much time you actually spent on it. You're not tracking your time and you've lost largely a day, a week, a month and going and diving really deep into that project. And did you bill appropriately for that or not, right, is a large part of one of the pieces that you're mentioning. And the fundamental that I would say, and I don't know whether you're a time blocker and I'm a, I'm a firm, firm, firm believer of it, but there's the, the concept of Parkinson's law. Are you familiar with the concept of Parkinson's law? Um, I've read about it before, but let's uh, let's talk about it. So it's the theory essentially that every human being on the planet will utilize whatever available resources we have to us. And so it's kind of the concept of, you know, busy CEO has to send a postcard out to a relative versus grandma that is retired and doesn't have any, it has all the time in the world. Grandma will take six hours to send out the postcard. High powered CEO will take five seconds to dictate the postcard to their EA to get it out the door. And it's how much time do you currently have available to yourself? So how do you constrict the amount of time that you currently have available to ultimately force a decision? So what you're doing in those long, drawn-out creative processes is that 
you are allowing yourself far too much time. And it's essentially, in the end, giving yourself more rope than you should be and potentially giving the opportunity to hang yourself. So how do you constrain the available time, potentially putting a, a, a blocker in your calendar or a clock that you set on your on your desk of like, hey, I'm only going to give myself 30 minutes to go through this ideation process of this particular project or an hour or whatever that amount of time you're going to allocate, but making sure that you're stopping and giving yourself um, a measurement of how you actually will stop that that um, project from growing in 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 uh, infinitely in time. It kind of reminds me of the student that takes until the day before the test to cram everything and then writes a four page paper the night before. Um, kind of the same thought process there that they, they they had all that time but now they have to do it in four hours because that's all they have so if you kind of put that limit on you <clears throat> from the get-go i have four hours today to do this project even though you had it's a month away that it's due kind of the same principle applies you can get it done maybe do that just for the the rough draft and then revisit it a week later after it's kind of sat in your head for a little bit so yeah, uh no, i think I was you kind of follow add- Oh, sorry. Yeah, I was, I was just going to say, I think you follow the, the Pomodoro technique, right? Ryan, right. Ryan, don't you? Yeah. yeah. Well, and I was going to just add to that. I think that a big part of what you're describing is, I think, especially for the tactician, the person who just, you know, has a trade and they, you know, create an agency, for example, around their trade. I think that person, you know, may be doing some of this like time wasting stuff or investing so heavily in a project. Some of it is, yes, I mean, creative people have an ability to, you know, focus and really work on a thing like this. But I do think some of it too is like avoidance strategies, right? Like this is a way to avoid doing the things I don't want to do. You know, I don't want to worry about payroll. I don't want to worry about taxes. Instead, I'll just burn the midnight oil on this thing and then complain that we don't get paid enough. Like it's kind of a, you know, a, a an avoidance strategy, it seems like. I 100% will agree. And I will, I say this to clients all the time, but what I have personally found in that journey is that what I typically um, want to do least or I'm avoiding most the thing I want the most is immediately behind that item. So in order for me to get to what I want most, that freedom, the profit, all of those items, like we're avoiding those things because a, cu- a couple of reasons. What does it actually attach to our identity? What does it say about ourselves as a business owner, as a creative, as um, as a team member, as a business owner? All of those pieces, right? Is like what, if I look at the actual empirical evidence of what that means in a number per se for looking at a financial in this example, what does it actually say about me as a business owner? And so we avoid it because we don't want to confirm what we believe to be the case. And ultimately, you're just making that that ultimately come true. I was having a conversation with a, a client recently around this overarching same topic. And um, he was in a place where he's, he has a specific life outcome that he wants to be able to accomplish. He's got a kid of special needs and needing to save enough money to be able to provide lifelong support for his son. And the question I asked him, he was giving away way too much time to clients doing work ultimately for free, which is the plight of so many service businesses and agency owners, as well as kind of the thing that you were describing. And the question I asked him is, well, in that scenario, you have a choice to make. And in every single yes that you say, there's an inherent no. You have this financial goal that you're looking to accomplish to provide that life to your son. And every single time you say yes to a client to go above and beyond that scope that you're not going to charge for, you're saying no to a meal for your son in 20 years. And are you willing to make that choice and understand that every single decision that you're making every single day, every yes has a built-in no. That might be you're not able to spend this evening spending time with your family or going to go see a friend or, hey, I'm not going to be able to work on the next project to be able to bring in more revenue to hit the next objective. But every single yes that you say, there's an inherent built-in no. Yeah, no, I think that's a really smart way of looking at it because I think inherently this is a, a problem for you know a lot of people in service-based businesses is saying no, right? I think there's a, and maybe this is a mindset topic we did, could discuss, but uh, you know, especially in the freelance community, but uh, you know, other gig workers and small agency owners, people like that, you know, this, I guess, uh, feast or famine or this scarcity mindset where so many of us are caught up worried about the next project. So we just take bad jobs from bad people. We never say no to anything. So it, framing it mm-hmm. the way that you've just described, which is this, you know, that there's always this inherent no in there, that a sacrifice today means a sacrifice tomorrow, um, I, th- I think is a really interesting way of talking about, you know, being able to say no. But I wonder if you could elaborate on that. 
Yeah, absolutely. I mean, so, and as you sort of described, there's loads of different instances and every single day we're, we're met as a business owner, as a financial or as a, um, as a business leader, we're met with loads of different um, things that we have to ultimately make a decision on from who we're going to ultimately be working with. I mean, every single one of us has, I would imagine, and if you haven't, uh, good on you, but I would imagine the vast majority of us, at least in service-oriented businesses, have said yes to a client that we had that red flag during the sales process of we probably should say no. They're going to overrun. They're going to not be the right fit. We're not going to enjoy this work, but we say yes because of whatever sort of internal monologue that we are telling ourselves of why we have to. Financial reasons, we're not going to be able to get another person. We don't have enough leads or whatever, right? And largely to me, the way that I would look at it is what in that particular client, if I were to spend the time that I know that I'm going to be going over, I know that I'm not going to be able to charge the amount that I should. If I were to actually take that time and invest into what I need for the business to be able to have more leads, to have more clients, to be able to improve that system, improve that process, how much is that going to have long-term investment or long-term output to the business? And this largely is one of the biggest problems that I see with service-based businesses and agencies is that we're not investing any time back into the business. All of our time, 80, 90% of your time is served to the deliverable, to what that scope is. And ultimately, you're not spending any time growing the business. You're not developing leads. You're not developing your team. You are the hinge point. And ultimately, you're creating your own glass ceiling. And do you want to make that world a reality by saying yes to everything? And um, I, to me, that and the thing that I ask myself, and this is something that I've, I forget exactly what what, what book it's from, um, but it's either a hell yes, and if it's not like I want everything about this, I love everything about this. This is something that's gonna really feed my life, make me happy. If it's not a hell yes, then to me it's a hell no every single time. So I, I would rather say no to something. I think, I think that's Simon Derek. Sinek. It's a it's Derek Sivers, I think, is the guy. Okay. So, or at yeah. least he ripped that idea off. I know there's a Derek <laughs> Sivers book. About we're we're all over the board. <laughs> so, no, it was awesome. someone. Yeah, for sure, somebody. So thanks to whoever that was. But I think that's a, yeah. a good attitude, right? This idea of you know either get excited about it or don't do it. And you know it's funny because I complain all the time to my wife. You know, like. She's a, a school teacher. She just got off for the summer and she's like, Hey, maybe at lunch you could do this. And I'm like, what's lunch? You know, who gets a lunch? She's like, Ryan, you work for yourself. Take a lunch. Like, I mean, you don't have to ask anybody, just leave, you know, but, but even just, I mean, my first impulse was no, obviously I can't break for lunch. What are you talking about? I don't have any time for that, you know? And, uh, and so it's so funny how just, you know, it, I mean, to your point about, you know, hell yes or no, you know, I was like, no, I'm not going to lunch, but I should have been saying, hell yes, there's an opportunity to go to lunch. And so now granted, that's not a very business, uh, fa you know, favorable business outcome, but it probably does more for me mentally, which will leave me more prepared to work the rest of the day and, you know, so on. So I think uh, getting excited about stuff or just not doing it is not a bad way to look at it. I'm going to disagree with you that it actually doesn't have a, a direct business impact for you to have said yes to your wife and gone to lunch because it actually is starting to have you have less time available to make a different decision. Because that's going to force you to delegate something that you otherwise would have held on to. That's going to force you to reduce the meeting times that you have available to yourself that afternoon. And it forces a decision upon yourself of what you're going to have to do differently that day. So one of the biggest impacts, and my my husband, in my own journey, I was working like a lot of agency owners, working 80, 90 hour weeks. I was My eyes were open. I was working. And I hated my life. I was successful by, you know, business measurement, right? I had a good amount of revenue, large amount of profit, and I was happy about all of that piece of it, but I wasn't enjoying my life because of it, right? Like I had all the money, but no time to spend it. And the first sort of step that I had to take was I was obviously having a negative impact on my marriage and on my relationship. And I started to put, hey, what what actually is the thing that I have to do to invest back into my marriage and to my personal life? And so I sat with my husband and I asked him a very blunt question of what do I have to do to have you not leave me? Because I know that I'm not spending any time with you. I largely have turned this marriage into a roommate oriented situation, really, rather than an actual marriage. And um, 
set some parameters in place, which forced me to make different decisions. I had less time available, so I used it differently. I delegated more. I let go of more. And ultimately, it had tremendous impact, not only to my personal life, but ultimately to the business as well, because now I was able to take on more clients. I was able to have more impact because I was thinking about things differently and how I actually approached my time and my day, reducing meetings from 30 minutes to 25 minutes or from 50 minutes to 45 minutes and just continuing how do I save a little bit here and there and just shave off some time to get more done in a day. Yeah, no, I think that's a, a great point. And uh, I do appreciate the little therapy sash too, because, uh, you know, I, we're getting even more value out of this one. So my <laughs> wife will uh, not be listening to this episode though. Um, <laughs> no, but I will, uh, I'll start showing up and then I'll take credit, uh, all the credit for it. So it'll work out. Um, no, I think that that's a, a, I mean, it's interesting because it's so counterintuitive, right? I think so many of us think that we need to work more or, or spend more time or whatever. And I think your point about decision-making is really interesting. And it's funny that you're saying this, like just an hour before we got on the show here, I, I was watching a YouTube video, this guy talking about some secret he learned about, you know, life, but through creating art. And one of the metaphors he used was basically this idea that, you know, sitting down to a blank sheet of paper is really challenging, right? The sky's the limit. You could sit and draw anything. So most of us get caught up in some sort of analysis and just don't do it. Instead, mm -hmm. by setting some sort of parameter, so in his case, it was drawing ibises. And if I remembered the guy's name, I'd give him a shout out. But um, but anyway, he was drawing little birds. And uh, But this this person who he looked up to as a mentor had encouraged him, just draw the same thing every day. Just sit down, draw a bird. That's your thing. You draw a bird every day. And the point was not so much about drawing a bird every day, but what it forced him to do was sort of put rails on an otherwise just you know wide open world. And it removed all that sort of paralysis that happens when we get caught up thinking, right? It, it removes the the need to sit and ponder and guess and wonder and all that stuff. It just sort of puts you on a path. And so I think your point about, you know, by actually working a shorter day, you know, and making time for your family and, and children and whomever, you know, whatever you want to do, or just time for your hobby or time to read or whatever you want to do. By forcing your work day into a smaller box, you are forced to make decisions that will move you along more quickly. And I think it's counterintuitive, but I think it's also genius. It, yeah, it definitely feels counterintuitive, especially when you're in a place where you don't feel like you have time and that you have all these goals and you have to do more, right? Um, and focus is 100% the key to being able to have the success, that thing that you're looking and striving to accomplish. And I'm pretty sure it was Steve Jobs that said that success isn't about the yeses. It's actually more about the no's that I'm as equally proud of the work that I accomplished as I am about the things I said no to. Now, sometimes saying no to people is the hardest thing. Um, I get a lot of people hit me up for audio engineer work and they don't have a budget. And for the first little bit, the first year that I was doing it, I was going to open mic events and I was you know, donating my time and, and just trying to let people know that I'm around. But uh, after people knew that I was around, they're hitting me up for other gigs, trying to get me to bring my own gear, trying to get me to do all this other stuff. And I, I have to say, no, I can't say yes. Even though I'm available, even though I have the time, I have to put some sort of a value on my time or, or people will walk all over me. And, and, and it just, it's, even though it's not necessarily a business, it's a passion. It's something I love to do. I'm very picky and choosy on on the people I say yes to. If it's an artist that I, they have a song that I like, a song that that they perform that's really good, and I want to capture that moment. Yes, I'll do it. If it's someone that just needs a sound guy and needs a sound system for an event they're doing, and there's no money involved, I'm not going to go and do it. Uh, one other thing that uh, I've been thinking of while we've been having this conversation and, and time and making time is um automating things uh this year for my weddings and stuff that i, I every I, you probably don't know much about my my work uh, i'm a, a performer i do weddings i provide sound systems and most of my events are pretty high dollar events cool. but the back and forth between the clients is a big hang up getting all the information for the venue, for the songs they want to have for the, there's a, a lot of back and forth. And, and this year I was, I actually, I sat down and I recorded a 15 minute YouTube video, a screen share of my process of what I do, 
how I do it, why it's advantageous to do it that way and explaining it to the client. And uh, I did, I created a Google planning form and, and sent them a link that had the video in it and said, hey, please watch this video first. And I've noticed that it's eliminated 90% of the back and forth that I used to always have. And it just automated that process where instead of me jumping on a Zoom call with the, the client, I just sent them that link and it it answers all the questions there and eliminates that back and forth that I'd have with every other client. And I think there's little tips and tricks that in any business that you can kind of apply that same kind of thought process. How can I make this easier? How can I set up this system where it's going to automatically send the invoice and I don't have to remember to do it myself? Stuff like that, I think is really key to growing a business and, and, and making it easier on yourself. So I 100% agree. There was a, quite a few little tidbits that I thought would be of value to hit one. The, one of the things that I would say, and I always ask this question, I'm fat kid at heart, right? I want to have my cake and eat it too. So <laughs> you gave option, option a of, I can say yes to this person, help them when they don't have a budget, or I can say no, which yes, those are two very apparent options, but is there an option C? And that was one of the situations that I had, right? Is I've got loads of agency owners and I'm, I, they need help or, but are not at the size that they need to be in order for it to make sense for them to be able to afford working with me. And ultimately, how do I still have impact for them? How do I still help, help them change their lives as well? Right. So, which actually led to me writing my first book of how can I actually provide value while not necessarily having to actually work with them and then also utilize it as a marketing tool for me to be able to bring in the paying clients long-term as well. So how can I do both at the same time? And there's, I'm always looking for option C. There's option A and option B are always readily apparent, but what is option C? And I'm always looking for what option C is. But I 100% agree on the automation piece of it. I mean, there's so, me and my team are always working. Every quarter we have a goal of how do we automate eight hours of time within the business. And for two goals, one, the first and the foremost is how do I get more accuracy in data or in systems that allow for us to have better repeatable results for client experience or internal experience, but then how do you actually gain efficiency at it, right? So how do we save that time as well? Had a client from exactly what you're talking about. He came to me a couple of months ago when he started working with me in it was September, October of last year. He was doing about $30,000 in revenue. And the numbers he just submitted last month were 175000 in monthly recurring revenue. So it's grown dramatically. But three months ago, he came to me and was like, Robert, I have to stop growth. I can't grow anymore. I need to go hire a lot of new team members. I've got to train them. I've got to get them up to speed. Like I can't grow for the next three to four months. Well, I hire people, figure all that out, get them all on board. I was like, well, what's option C? option C that we came up with was the automation thing that you were just talking about. How do you automate the onboarding process? How do you gather the information from the client to allow for everyone to have 100% of the information when they go to do it? I mean, you lose so much time starting and stopping as you were describing, oh, I got this piece of information. What, should, what about this? You didn't answer this question. You answered this one, but you didn't answer this and constantly following up and loads of administrative time. And so he was able to actually save 40% of the amount of time that he had across capacity across the business by automating his entire onboarding process from forms to videos to systems that allowed for them to understand and then changed his sales process to allow for them to understand this is how you're able to get it for this price point. This is also the more information that you actually filled, the more time that you spent on this particular document, on this particular piece of information that you provide to me has a higher likelihood of us being able to actually accomplish the outcome that they're there for as well. So in your example for a bride and groom, they want to have an amazing event. They're investing loads of time into loads of time and money into this event. It's also a celebration of their love and commitment to each other and want to have a phenomenal day. The if you were to position it and if you spend the time to do all of these items, we're going to ensure that you actually have people on the dance floor. You're going to have greater engagement. You're going to have so much more fun the day of so you can actually spend time with family and friends rather than dealing with X, Y, or Z on the day of. So you get exactly. motivation, excitement, engagement in it. Um, one thing that I've noticed too as well is by automating the system, it also kind of sets the rules in place. It, it tells the clients, you know, this is what I expect. This is what 
you know, I expect from you and what you should expect from me um, in last payments due 30 days before. And instant, and when they get that email for the last payment, it's not out of the blue, like you're chasing hounding money from them kind of thing. It, it kind of, it, it puts all the things in order to where they don't have any surprises. And then also I would follow up with is as you're developing the system, if you notice the hang up, if you notice, oh, they did this instead of this, they must have interpreted it wrong. Go back and change your process so you don't have that hang up again. As you notice little things that that come up, um, pay attention to it instead of just ignoring it and saying, oh, oh, they obviously couldn't read what I was getting there. Make it more obvious so you don't have the problem in the future with other clients. So. Incredibly astute, right? Like there's so many times that we are going like kind of um, putting out fires day to day, right? Like we're just kind of playing whack-a-mole in, in our business, but not ultimately solving the primary problem that we are actually having. And um, every, and I, f- I should probably look up exactly who it was that said this particular one, because I do quote this one um, loads. If you um, never let a good crisis go to waste. So how do you leverage every single thing that's happening in your business, in your day-to-day life that allows for you to actually process augmented so that you're solve it one time and in perpetuity? And so the first thing I always ask when, when something goes wrong is, well, do we have a system for this? Yes or no? No? Okay, well, let's create one. Would the system have actually solved for this problem? Yes or no? No? Okay, well, let's augment the process so that it'll solve for this problem. And those are always the first two questions that I ask in every single issue that comes up in the business. And all right, let's go and do that and spend the time investing in actually creating that system so I can solve it in perpetuity. Uh, Ram Emanuel, uh, according to Google. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah. No. So one of the things, so we've been talking a lot, you know, here about efficiency and improving processes. And earlier we were talking about decision making. And one of the real challenges for, you know, real, uh, really a lot of small business owners, especially people in the service business, but even more, especially in creative services, is trying to, I guess, specialize or niche down. And I can speak as a lifelong generalist that it's really, really difficult to market a company that does everything. And, you know, Mm -hmm. I I have worked really hard to try and narrow our scope. And somehow I keep, you know, expanding and keep offering the whole thing. And I've I've been spoiled to, you know, for the last 20 years in our business, because a lot of our our business has come through reputation and through, uh, you know, networking and getting to know people. But we've been very not successful in terms of attracting outside business from new people that we don't know through other channels. And I think a big part of that is our message is really blurry. It's, you know, it's difficult to know what it is we do, even though we could do anything for you. You know, if I come to you and say, hey, man, what what do you need? I do everything. You know, it's really difficult for you to choose. So back to our our concept of decision making and all that stuff. Can we talk about niching down or, or specializing in an agency or in a service business and why that's important? Oh man! All right, uh, let's let's go ahead and spend an hour on this particular topic because it's definitely a huge one. There's so many far-reaching implications, and marketing is one of them. But it's not the only one. That's just the beginning of the effect that it has across the entire business. I mean, the reality is one of the things that you said was like, "Yeah, I, I could probably do anything," but the reality is, that, no, right? Like, I I went to to study photography and I realized that wasn't who I was meant to be. Right? Like, there's a zone of genius that we have of what we are ultimately best in class at. I didn't enjoy it. There's loads of other photographers that are a hundred times better than I am and will always be, no matter how much time I actually spent on that particular piece. There's a thing that I do phenomenally well, and I should focus on that particular area. Um, just from a marketing perspective, the thing that I that frustrates me incredibly is that, and I challenge you to do this yourself, but to take your website, remove all the branding, just take the copy, look at the nearest five competitors to you and take the copy of their site and put it side by side. Can you tell whose copy was whose? Probably not. And so now we're frustrated and, hey, I'm not able to charge enough. Our clients are not saying yes. We're not able to sell. I'm not attracting the person. And of course you're not. You're sound exactly the same as every single other person out there. And you, they have zero way of differentiating you from anyone else. The only way that they can actually differentiate you is based on price. So it's ultimately a race to the bottom continuing to eat away at every single agency's margins and why by and large the vast majority unless you're a freelancer which i would still argue you're not very profitable right 
that it's just your labor and your trading time for money. But ultimately, the vast majority of agencies are in the sub 8% net profitability. And they're producing phenomenal work, changing the lives of their clients, but not having any real impact on theirs. And they're largely committing their entire every waking moment of their lives in anxiety, stress, trying to take on as much business as they can so they can get to that next sort of tranche of what they believe success is supposed to look like, but never accomplish it yeah, because they're trying too. to be everything to everyone. That, that that level of profitability you're describing, I mean, that pertains to the biggies too. Like we're we're not just talking little agencies. Yeah. Like, I mean, go all yep. the way to the top. And you know, I mean, I obviously don't know like Ogilvy's numbers or whatever, but I mean, but this is a problem for big agencies, mm -hmm. like all, all the way to the top. Mm -hmm. And those guys do do everything and they do shoot everything and they do, you know, all these things. And I mean, so if you're looking at the model, you should be able to sort of, I guess, analytically go, well, maybe that's not a great model. And on top of it, we're not, you know, Ogilvy, we're not WPP, right? We're not Dentsu. Like, we don't have the resources that they have available either, right? So why are we trying to follow a model that ultimately, like, we're following this madman sort of age of what we perceived an agency to be, right? That we're supposed to be that everything to, to them. And largely, you were sold a lie. You're, one, you're not good at everything. Every time you're doing something new, one, the client isn't having the, the outcome that they should. You're... Eh, at best, on that that new thing that you're doing, or you had to spend an incredibly long period of time to figure it out to make it really good, and so your profit margins are going down. You're not able to take on additional work. You're likely, as the owner, being brought into this project to try to figure it out because you have that years worth of experience. I was asked by a a current client during a a, a sales call when we first started working together a year and a half ago. And the question he, he posed to me was, hey, Robert, um, so I've got 30 years of experience in this industry and 30 years of experience doing this work. How are you going to help me get my team to have the equivalent of number of ex the years of experience in a short period of time? And my response was, I can't. But I can help you be okay with it. I can help you reduce the amount of things that you're doing so that your team can have specialization in the thing that they do, right? I mean, the, um, I'm forgetting the word, but uh, the assembly line model, right? Like we know that it's efficient. We know that it works. And I'm not trying to say that for your agency, I want to cr create a, for a creative output, I'm trying to turn your, your business into an assembly line by and large, because it's not ultimately what you do, but the better and the more that we can get into that area, the better it ultimately can be. You're going to have better output for your clients. You're going to have a greater amount of profitability. You're able to market better. Like it affects every single piece of the business. Your margins are better. It's it it's life changing to the business to specialize. Well, the and it's argument funny because... against is, oh, go ahead. Largely, the biggest argument against it is I'm going to say no to business. Right? I'm going to have less opportunity, and that's a lie itself as well. Yeah, no, I think, and I, that was actually the point I was interrupting you with, sorry, because <laughs> the idea that, um, yeah, no, I, I'm bad at that. Sometimes I get excited. Um, but <laughs> no, but the idea is, you know, that assembly line model doesn't seem very attractive, especially to creative people. They go, oh, well, you know, I want to yeah. be creative. I want to think about all this stuff. You know, we need to be doing these things. And I almost look at it, you know, using Mike's example earlier about being able to say yes and say no, kind of at, at your leisure, you know, it's giving you back this autonomy, right? You, you instead of being forced to say yes every time, or forced to say no, you get to say yes to the ones you want and no to the ones you don't. And if you out of a labor of love or a client comes along and you just align with them and have the same passions and you really want to put in some extra time on them, go nuts. Now you have the time to do it because all the stuff that you're mm -hmm. not so jacked about is running along just fine on this, this you know automated platform. So I think that that's a, a really smart observation. I also want to point out something and I, 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 I think that it's uh an interesting sort of juxtaposition on that this concept, right? Be, but as you were pointing out, this white sheet of paper, right? That you can go in loads of different directions. With the white sheet of paper, creativity is easy, right? I could do anything. You can make a What's paper hard airplane. is <laughs> correct. Yeah. And but with your example of drawing a bird every single day, being creative in that bird is harder. You want to be a creative, a truly inspiring creative. Do the hard work. 
actually be creative into something that actually feels a bit more constricted because that's where innovation actually happens is in there. Sure, take the white sheet of paper or the white canvas and create new. But quite frankly, that's the easy work. Doing that with every single client across the board, I would challenge you to be a better creative. Yeah, no, I think that's right. And it's funny too, I just wanted to make this little point about specializing too. You know, we're talking about these agencies and that they do everything for everybody and that they can do this stuff largely because they have the resources, you know, that a, a smaller agency doesn't. But I guess as as fuel mm -hmm. or evidence of, of the importance of niching, you know, a lot of those agencies rely on a vast network of freelance support, people that do special things, mm -hmm. right? And so, and mm -hmm. this is my relationship with some of our early clients was, you know, I, I worked for different agencies and things like that. And I mean, I'm a broad creative director in that I have a lot of skills in a lot of different areas. But these agencies came to me for that, right? They didn't come for me to start video editing. They didn't come for me to do this or that. They came to me to direct a video or to uh, direct a, a new magazine ad or whatever, right? But there was an expertise that I had that they needed. And so they would augment their broad service offering by bringing in specialists to do little things. And so as a mm -hmm. freelancer, as a gig worker, the opportunity is to be best in class at something. And as you extrapolate mm -hmm. that to a small agency or even a midsize agency, if you are the best in class at your thing, business will come, right? These big guys need your specialization. These, you know, uh, companies that need a certain thing are going to need your thing. Like, you know, and if, from the alternative angle, from the marketing perspective, you know, it makes it so much easier to sell. Hey, we, we only sell tires. Okay, well, everybody who needs a tire can come to you now and get a tire. But if you sell tires, brakes, struts, alignments, engine work, blah, 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 blah. There's a place for that. And people need these generalists in their life. But at the end of the day, now you're just a generalist and you may not be the expert on, you know, the best tank tire I need. Right. And so I think that there's a, a real point to be made around specialization. But I also acknowledge just from my own experience that it's wildly difficult. And so I don't know. I mean, can you maybe walk us through a little bit of the process on how you might help someone make decisions? Yeah. So a couple of things. Um, first thing that I want to hit on that and i'll walk you through the niching component and i think that that's that needle in the haystack kind of issue right is like what direction do i go we're trying to consider too many things but as a business owner and this is to every single person not just creatives that are listening we have an incredible amount of risk that we have assumed as being a business owner we also have taken on the we get to think about the business while we're sitting on the couch while we're reading a book or we're going on a walk or we're having dinner like we get to live and breathe our businesses. There's loads of pieces that we have taken on. And if we are going to take on that amount of risk, that amount of thinking, the passive and active time within the business, why the hell not do something that you actually really enjoy? Something that you're actually passionate about. I mean, there's not a single person that if you were to think about as someone that was magnetic in your life, that was doing something that was that that generalist person. It's not. It's a person that's actually truly passionate, excited about what they're talking about, about what they're engaging with. It ultimately brings people in, and you're going to find that you're going to bring in your ideal client, your soulmate client, when you actually start to do the thing that you absolutely love and that you're truly passionate about because people want to be around that kind of person. Now to answer the question about how do you decide, I, I break it down into chunks. Um, with any client that's going to go through our process. Because when you try to consider the myriad of different outcomes and potentials and different industries and how would that affect service model, how is that going to impact our existing client base and whether they can afford us, are there enough of them, all of those components, right? Like you're never going to make a choice. You're overwhelmed with options. And so the first step is just brainstorm. Go through your client list over the past couple of years, write down the industries that they've been in. What other industries are you interested in? Do you have a specific expertise in a particular area? Write those down too. Then I want you to then eliminate or filter through a couple of questions. Can you help them? Do you enjoy them? Do you have the expertise in that industry? Yes or no? If you don't get a yes to every single one of those questions, it doesn't move on to the next step. And realistically speaking, this final step of it, you're in this three to five probably oriented niches that you'd be considering at this point. And now you want to confirm it with a data point as the accountant in me would want every single one of you guys to do. And so then we do some statistical research of how many businesses are in the space. Is that industry growing? 
are they going to be more relevant? Like, am I going to want to invest in being specialized in trucking right now? Probably not, considering there's going to be lots of automation there. What is the average size of the business? Can they afford you? And if I were to hit 1% of the market, would I hit my long-term goals? Yes or no? And by the point you've gone through each one of those steps, you've gotten to one maximum of two. And if you ended up with more than that, I'm sorry, you weren't being honest with yourself throughout the rest <laughs> of the process and go back and do it again. Yeah, no, I think that's really interesting. And I, I think there's this thing, and, and again, maybe it's me laying myself out there and maybe this isn't everyone's life experience, but I think in sort of a world of social media and trying to live up to the expectations of others, a lot of us kind of lose sight of maybe what our passion is. And I know for me, I chased a lot of things because it's what I thought I needed to do or maintain an appearance because I thought it was the appearance I needed to have to fit into a certain group or a certain way of doing business. And so I know for me, like I've had a really difficult time niching down for reasons like that in that I almost feel like I've kind of lost myself. Like I'm not totally sure what mm -hmm. it is I want. I know mm -hmm. what I do a lot of, and I don't know that I like it or don't like it because I don't, know what else there is. Right. And so, I mean, it sounds stupid, right? Because you should have a relationship with yourself where you can figure this stuff out. But I think there are people, you know, either like me, or I hope it's a bigger problem than just me, but um, you know, that there are people who, you know, have sort of lost sight of this. And so I, I have trouble distilling down, you know, how to, I guess, be honest with yourself, right? Like, uh, you know, how to make sure that you're not, you know, cou couching your decision-making process in this sort of cycle of, you know, whatever you're into. You know, for example, we, we do a lot of work for a particular type of client, but I wouldn't say we like it, but it's probably the lowest hanging fruit, right? Like, so it's the easiest one for us because we've done a lot of work for them. So if I was being asked to niche my agency down today, you know, it would be obvious or it would be a, a probably a wise business decision to stay in that niche, even though it's not necessarily something I love. So is it worthy of doing that kind of thing? Or, I mean, from like a, a holistic business standpoint, does it make sense to shift gears completely and, and find the thing you love? Largely, short answer is yes, but I want to say that you're in good company. Um, I'm the kid that in high school at a party brought out an Excel document to show my friends a model because that's how much I enjoy data, right? <laughs> Absolutely, completely the most uncool thing, did not get a good response, but yet still went to school for <laughs> photography, right? Like, very obvious. Did, did you know yourself well enough? Absolutely did not, clearly. And that was should have been more obvious. And it's it's something that we all go through, right? It's like, here's who I imagine myself to be, and then here's who I ultimately am. And one of the things that alongside this that I have clients do immediately before, and I would challenge you to do the same, is write down your story, completely unfiltered. Just go through and write every single thing down from first memory that you have, just spend a couple hours sitting outside. I love a good hammock, but just write everything down. And then go through your story afterwards and just highlight those key moments that led you to be where you are right now. And what were the pieces that you really enjoyed about your life? Like, what are the pieces that, as a, as one of my clients would say, made your tummy smile? Those like butterfly <laughs> feelings that you have inside of yourself, right? Like, as I as I mentioned before, like I don't I I personally wouldn't want to run a business anymore that doesn't add value to my life, doesn't make me happy, doesn't make me excited. It just wouldn't be worth it for me. Um. And I also will point out, right, there was, I think they made it to like $100 million in revenue a year selling pet rocks. If someone can monetize a pet <laughs> rock, like we can monetize whatever we want, right? Like, sure. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, I think that's right. You know, but I, I think, you know, that's a nice little exercise and, and probably something worth trying because I, I do think that there's, you know, a lot of external forces that maybe didn't exist so much for prior generations, or maybe they did in a different way. And, and I'm being elitist, assuming it's just our generation that's dealing with this. But um, <laughs> but I think we have more opportunity now maybe than ever to compare ourselves to other people. And, you know, for good or for bad, right? Yep. I mean, there's plenty of people who compare themselves to, you know, I don't know, your Warren Buffetts and then go on to be great, you know, stock investors or whatever, right? So there's a version of comparison that sure. builds up, but there's also a version of comparison that tears down. And so much of yep. it too is deception. You know, It's the influencer in front of the Lamborghini that doesn't belong to them. <laughs> you know, it's that kind of thing. And so we get caught <laughs> yeah. up in that we get caught up in their lifestyle, but their lifestyle isn't really their lifestyle, you know, but we don't know that. So I think that there's a lot of those sort of, you know, mental and emotional things to work through too. So I, I appreciate taking a minute to think about it.
Um, I was wondering if we could talk about your books. Uh, you've written two of them, The Agency Blueprint and The Practical Agency. And um, can you tell us a little bit about, about the books, about your writing process? And um, do you use any tools to, to help you write? Um, are there any, uh, I, like, I've always had the... Uh, the dream of writing a book, <laughs> but I've never actually gotten past the first chapter. So if you could help break that down for us, that'd be great. Sure. Um, so the first one, and I should probably write another book so I can be a bit more healthy and work out again. And so I'll tell you why I'm saying that. The So the first step that I did for both of them was ultimately who is it being written for? So the agency blueprint was written for agencies that are in the one, one and a half million plus in revenue that are looking to scale and how do they extract themselves from a lot of the day-to-day -day of the business. And then the practical agency was written for the agencies between the 250,000, 150,000 to that 1.5 million. And how do they get the foundation ultimately that they need to be able to grow to that that next sort of level of, of growth? So I, I spent time like, what exactly do they actually need to get to that next stage to get what they want? And put together just loads of notes around what that would look like. And then I built my table of contents. And then I spent with my headphones and ear and just talked out each chapter and had them transcribed and utilize that as the base. So I just, as you guys maybe have gone to see, I can be quite long winded and can <laughs> talk my, my, uh, my thoughts out quite well. I'm, I've got the gift of the gab, if you will. And uh, so I, that's how I went about getting most of it out of my head and then went through rounds of editing and reorganization. Clearly it's not going to come out in a linear way that way, but um, then reorganized it and then turned it into a book. I like that approach, the being able to just talk about it and then get it on paper. And then you can take the paragraphs and move them around to fit more accordingly to what you actually, because lots of times when you're just going off the cuff and just talking, you have ideas coming in and out rapidly and you just kind of say them here, saying, oh, it might actually make better sense to talk about this first, then talk about this and talk about that. And by just getting it out there and getting it on paper, then you can kind of put it in the order it needs to be and refine it and refine it until you get the finished product. Um, Cause you know, like Ryan was talking about that blank sheet of paper sitting in front of a blank computer monitor and trying to get the words on the, on the paper. Um, daunting. Yeah. Very daunting. And, and I think having a conversation and just talking is a much easier way to get it out there to begin with. And then kind of, own it from there. Well, and I think too, just being laser focused on who it is you're speaking to, right? It's easy to have this conversation, you know, as if a, you know, I don't know, little ghost human came and asked you a question. You can brain dump these things in response to their question if you know who this avatar is, right? And so in your case, uh, Robert, yeah. by knowing that you were talking to an agency owner that's experiencing a certain level of issues, whether, you know, because hey, there's probably some truths at each of those kind of mile markers, right? At the million plus- yep you know, level, there's, you know, issues, you know, A through Z and at the other one, you know, you've got one through 10 or whatever. And so I think knowing and yep. being able to separate those things probably helped too. Yeah, it, yeah, it absolutely did. It helped direct my decision-making. Starting with the table of contents too is another kind of genius move, you know, get the broad overview and then refine, refine, refine uh, in each bullet point instead of, you know, oh, I want to talk about this and then, you know, not have a, a roadmap to to follow. The Starting with the table of contents is, is smart. Yeah. One last thing I'd like to hit here in our sort of closing minutes. Uh, we, you know, talked a lot about decision making and, and niching and all, all the things that are really important. And, and obviously, as we have this conversation, you can really see how related all those things are. One of the things I want to talk to you about, and I, I don't know if anybody has the answer, but I'd be curious what your answer is, is how to get from this sort of theoretical step, you know, where we understand, okay, niching is a good thing. Okay. I agree with you. Now, how do we actually take action? I think that this is where it, things fall apart for so many people. I know I'm a notorious book reader. I read all the greats, you know, yet I'm not a billionaire just yet, you know? And so like, <laughs> I mean, so there's clearly a disconnect between just being able to take in information and turning it into some output. And so I wondered if you had any pointers, I suspect a lot of times fear or lack of knowledge or something leads to this trepidation. But I wonder if you had sort of pointers for just getting started and actually doing it. Uh, a couple of things. Um, one, deadlines I find to be incredibly important, but I also think that the personality component, I don't think it's a one size fits all. For me, 
if I set a deadline of, you know, this is what I'm going to accomplish by when, like, come hell or high water, that is going to happen no matter what. Um, and that the taking action component, I am um, read a book not too long ago, say 12 months ago, um, that I would suggest since you're a book reader. It's called The Four Tendencies and Why Someone Takes an Action Versus Won't. And so for me, I'm an upholder. I will take both internal and external expectations. I will meet them. If I set a goal for myself, I'm going to meet it. If someone else needs something for me, I will meet that as well. And understanding why you ultimately want to do something and what actually is going to drive you to do it, understanding how you have that internal motivation is incredibly important. Every single one of us has fear. And that obviously has an impact to this as well. Um, for the niching side of it, I mean, I think that there's specific things that we would do, and it ultimately depends on what the context of the situation is. The I was asked this question actually during a call yesterday of someone that is in the process right now of niching down, and he's like, well, what does that mean for my existing clients? Am I going to get people not ultimately wanting to buy from me anymore of all the existing business that I have, and how is that going to impact that? And I'm worried about this. And my question to the group of some 25 odd agency owners that were in the Zoom call was, can every single one of you guys chat, type into the chat box how many times you guys have been to my website after you guys hired and work, started working with Creative Agency Success? There was one person that said that they had been to my site in that entire group since they had decided to work with us. I'm like, You're, we are putting so much weight on every single one of these pieces of external perceptions, how it's going to have that impact. And largely, it's 90% of it is in our head. Same concept of like, you were walking down the street and you fell in front of a group of people, right? And you're embarrassed as all hell. You're thinking about it for hours. But how many how many seconds did the people that saw you fall think about it? If they thought Two about it at all. Seconds? Nothing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Uh, what, yeah, it's and, the same thing I tell my son, right? Is is this this idea like we put a lot of self-importance on ourselves, you know, the 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 things that we do are going to be judged or you know, and I I think too that that's kind of excuse making, right? That's that's us putting roadblocks yeah. in front of us. We don't need to do that because people will think poorly of me or you know, I you know, like I I'm the center of attention and <laughs> I've had to tell my son on numerous occasions I'm like but everybody, like, you know, he's in high school. I'm like, everybody that you go to high school with is in their own head, wondering about what everybody mm -hmm. thinks about them. They don't think about you mm -hmm. at all. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. So it's like, unless you're right, you know, there's some reason to think about you. They're having an interaction, you know, outside of that, they're going, oh man, do I look right? Am I wearing the right thing? Or, you know, does so-and-so like me? Blah, 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 whatever it is. And, uh, and so I think it, it's really funny, but I think it's a really good point, you know, that, it, that so much of the problems or so much of the things that get in our way of action I think are are just in our head. It's confirmation bias too, right? Like we have a perception of who we are and the type of person that we are. Do we are we a good business owner, a bad business owner? Are we a good creative, a bad creative? Am I good at numbers? Am I bad at numbers? And so then we are confirming time and time again, creating that situation to then confirm the thing that we believe about ourselves. And it's like, yeah, well, obviously I already knew that I was bad at numbers. And then here I avoided looking at my financial statement and I lost money last year. Yeah, but it's because I bet at numbers. It's like, well, yeah, but you didn't look at your financial statement all year. You weren't looking at how you can make sure that you're profitable. It's like you created that reality and now you're just confirming it by not having done anything to change it. So that's, we do that all the time. Every single one of us on the planet does that. And uh, we're making that reality and confirming what we are telling ourselves about ourselves. Yeah. Uh, it's, if you avoid the hard stuff, you're never going to get it done. And that's for sure. You, you got to, you got to flex and, and use muscles that you don't usually use, whether it's math, whether it's creativity. I'm not good at drawing or doing design. And I opened Photoshop shop the other day and, and tried to make a flyer. It, it It's not the easiest thing in the world, but you got to do it just to get the reps in to get better at it. Um, whether it's playing the piano, whether it's um, playing an instrument or whatever you're doing, if you avoid the stuff you're not good at, you're just confirming the fact that you're not good at it. It's pretty, exactly what you just said. Um, we're at that time. Do you want to tell people where they can uh, find you, reach out, get in touch if they um, want to, or where they can find your books? Yeah, there's. so I'm giving away a copy of my my book, The Practical Agency. If you actually go to creativeagencysuccess.com forward slash eggs, uh, there's three different things you can do on that page. If you're an agency owner, you want to figure out how exactly you can position yourself fast. There's a system to actually go through creating your capabilities deck and exactly how you pitch. 
you're wanting to dig into a little bit more on how to build the foundation in your business, you can download a free copy of my book, The Practical Agency. And if you're wanting to chat about your specific situation, wanting to make a change now, I'm happy to have a 15 minute chat with you, put together a little bit of an action plan. And so there's a link to book a call there as well. Perfect. So thank you yeah, so much well, for your time. Yeah, no, this has been amazing. Thank Absolutely. you so much. Thanks for so, having me, guys. Absolutely. And thanks so much to everybody who tunes into the show this week and every week. And we'll see you guys next time.